Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. I trust that your week has been a good one. Yeah. And if not, good. Thank you, David. <laughs> it is good. Perfect. If not, God is good all the time. It is good to see you here this morning. As I said before, I do have an announcement that I would like to share, and then Joel's going to come up and, and share some as well. Um, we are going to have a men's breakfast. Ladies, do not attend. But men are going to have a men's breakfast. June 3rd, 8 a.m. in this building. We are now, I, I am told that um, a, an international chef is going to be catering this for us. Um, he goes by the moniker of Vince Pilati. So Vince is going to be catering for us. Um, we are going to eat at 8 a.m., gentlemen, so plan to be here at a little bit before 8, or there may not be any eggs left for you. But just, you know, try to be here. Um, we're not going to arm wrestle for the food or anything like that, but plan to be here June 3rd in this building, 8 a.m., for a men's breakfast. Please invite other people. I know, um, as, as Tom and I have been talking about this, I know he's inviting some folks. My brother and brother-in-law are both, both gonna be here, so they're gonna come along with us too. So it's open to all guys, high school and above this time, okay? So please invite others and plan to be here June the 3rd at 8 a.m. Joel? Good morning, folks. Go for it. One more thing, and if Tom's, Tom's telepathically saying you forgot to say, we need to know how many people are coming in order to have enough food. That's a very important part. So please, either see Tom or me, let me know if you're coming and how many people you're bringing. Did I get it all, Tom? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Joel? Got it. Um, our missionaries of the week are uh, John and Amanda Herrick. Uh, I don't have an update directly from them. Um, Right? You, actually, I may be wrong. Okay. Um, so I but continue to pray for them, for their, their health and their ministries. Uh, especially, it's, it's easy to, to forget that you, our missionaries are involved in ministries unless we're you know, past the, um, the date line. But uh, that they are um, ministering today, same as us, right? In their ministries and their Sunday church. Did, did you have something, Amy? Yeah, they're in Pennsylvania. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so Amy says they're, they're here in the States currently traveling um, and uh, ministering in several churches before they fly home next week, uh, or this week, I should say. Um, so pray for John and Amanda as, as they minister. I do have a, a quick update to share from uh, Bob Green, though. Uh, they sent a, a letter, and I, I, we, we've referenced this, but just give some updates on some of the um, um, where we talked about they found a, uh, a new plane. So he sent a, a uh, update on this. Um, it says, Patsy and I want to express our thanks and thank to thank you for your faithful prayers and support. We do not take for granted your faithfulness on our behalf. Um, so let me jump down to that part. Um, please continue to pray for and with us concerning the, the disposition of the Champion 7EC aircraft that has been returned to us. We would like to see this damaged plane rebuilt and used in the ministry of training missionary pilots. We need God's wisdom and direction in this, especially because of the expense and time required to rebuild the plane. Um, thank you again. Pray for souls to be saved. We have been able to make some new contacts for the Spanish Bible study group, but with little to no results yet. God is able. Uh, and that's just a, I wanted to share a quick update from Bob and Patsy Green. A few announcements. Um, pray for uh, Leon and the Hinton family during this time. Um, it's a loss of, of Linda. Um, it's good to be with the family for a little bit of time on Friday. And uh, any way that we can pray and support our, our brothers and sisters and this, this dear family um, in, this, in this time. Um, remember uh, Tim and Carrie, my parents, as they travel to arrive uh, June 7th on uh, Wednesday, and uh, as they prepare and, and kind of leave those ministries in, in uh, the leader's hands. 
so that they can come for the next several months and be in the States uh, doing their updates. Um, if you'd like to get together with them, um, they're open, you know, just contact me, let me know if you'd like to take them to lunch, grab a coffee, or schedule something with them, like we can, we can obviously work that out. Uh, remember Father's Day on June 18th. Uh, as far as I know, we will have Sunday school um, on that day, and um, we, which by the way, we are um, trying to figure out what to do in the case of the power going out. Uh, we had the power go out on that Mother's Day and uh, planning to have, you know, Sunday school planning to have service and it was just kind of a last minute thing. And you can kind of look around and go, okay, well, would we sit in a dark church with no air conditioning? Would we sit outside in the heat of the sun? You know, it's, we're trying to figure out. So we're, we're seeing what we can do in the case of something like that happening again. Um, if, if you need to be on the church reminders because we put out a last minute calling post, uh, please, if you're not, let us let Dave know and if you'd like to be on that calling post so that you don't miss a last minute update like that because I can see where that would be uh, frustrating. Um, and continue to pray for the pastoral search process. <clears throat> Let's go to the Lord in prayer and, and um, put the search before the Lord. Father, we are so grateful. That we can be here, Lord, to share this time together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for this family, Lord, that, that loves you, Lord, that uh, joins together to support each other, to love on each other, to, to serve each other, Lord, and to bring honor and glory to your name through that service. Uh, Lord, we pray for John and Amanda as they uh, minister today and, and, uh, and as they travel very soon back home. We pray that you would continue to give them health and strength and stamina uh, for these, these trips and Thankful that they can return home soon for rest, but the continuation of their ministries as well. Lord, we are thankful for this plane that, that uh, the Greens are able to get a hold of, and as they work on repairing it and to be useful for the ministry, that you would provide the funds and the time and the, um, the right people to come along that can repair uh, this plane and put it into good working condition for, for the ministry, Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, Pastor and Patty as they take a short little trip, and, and we pray for their refreshment and, and, and encouragement and energy, Lord, and for their health. We pray for Pastor with his uh, the trouble with his knees and that this would be able to be resolved soon. Lord, we pray for those who can't be with us, Lord. We uh, pray for their health and their encouragement, for especially for Bill and Gloria. We remember them and care for them, and, and uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd be uh, with them as we know that you are. We pray for the Hinton family, uh, Lord, as they, as they go through this time where loss, but also of, and it's of thankfulness, Lord, of knowing that, that Linda is home, that she's not in pain, she's not confused, she knows exactly where she is, and she knows her Savior, and Lord, we are so thankful that she can be home. Lord, we pray for Leon, and, and just the loss of, of his wife, and, and that we pray that you would continue to strengthen him and encourage him. Uh, Lord, as, as time goes on, uh, we pray that uh, whatever his needs are, that you, we know that you will supply. Lord, we pray that we can be a part of that as well. We are thankful for this time where we can um, praise you, Lord, and, and sing your praises, where we can pray and we, where we can uh, come before you as the, as the word is shared, Lord, that all would be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezra, uh, we'll read a few passages actually right at the end of Second Chronicles here in a minute. But uh, for the next three weeks, I'm actually going to be preaching through, uh, giving Pastor a little bit of a break, letting him rest, uh, which he well deserves. But also, um, my pleasure to be able to share the, the Word of God with you guys for the next few weeks. So pray for me throughout the week uh, as I prepare um, when it's, it's a little more difficult when you have a full-time job. Some pastors, some missionaries have to do that on occasion. Um, but uh, it's, it's my privilege to, to share with you from the Word today. We're going to be actually looking at um, themes through the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Uh, and just kind of picking some, some, some passages out of those books. Not to preach through a whole book in, in one sermon. Uh, that's, that's really hard to do. Uh, that takes a lot of preparation. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's easier to preach out of a verse or two than it is to preach over a whole book. Um, if I did that, uh, it would be maybe a typical Willoughby sermon where we go for an hour 15. So we won't do that. Um, but we are going to be in the book of Ezra. And today we're, we're going to be looking at trusting the Lord with difficult circumstances. And we're going to be looking specifically at the first return of the Jews from exile. Um, so to really to set kind of the, the, the background and the history here, um, keep your finger there in Ezra. You just turn a page back or, or two. Uh, to 2 Chronicles in chapter 36. At the end of 2 Chronicles, we read about the last kings of Judah. Um, and these are really the, 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 the last few passages of this book. Um, let me read to you, uh, and I'm going to jump around a little bit, but in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and I'm going to read the, kind of a description of these last three kings of the kingdom of Judah. Starting in verse 5, it says, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him and bound him with bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took to Babylon articles from the temple of the Lord and put them in his temple there. The other events of Jehoiakim's reign, the detestable things he did, and all that was found against him are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, uh, first and second kings. And Jehoiakim, his son, succeeded him as king. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months uh, and ten days. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In the spring, King Nebuchadnezzar sent for him and brought him to Babylon. Uh, together with the articles with articles of value from the temple of the Lord, and he made Jehoiakim's uncle Zedekiah king over Judah and Jerusalem. And lastly, verse 11, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, his, his, uh, his God, and he did not humble himself before Jeremiah, the prophet who spoke the word of the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. Furthermore, all the, leaders and, and the, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again. Because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messenger, despised his word, and scoffed at his prophets until his, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. After a two and a half month, and you can go back to the, to the image if you would, after a two and a half year long siege, uh, the siege of Jerusalem, of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, against Jerusalem, two and a half years, on the 18th of July of the year 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar breached the city walls of Jerusalem, and the devastation was absolute. Um, let me read to you that continued description in verse 17. It says, He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and spared neither young men nor young woman, old man or aged, God handed them all over to Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the kings and its officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The devastation was absolute, and there are descriptions throughout um, Scripture that are pretty horrifying uh, as to the state of Jerusalem during those two and a half years. There was... Um, complete starvation 
and a, and a complete famine in the land. A little over 130 years earlier, uh, the kingdom of Israel, so remember that the kingdoms had split from to Judah uh, in the south and Jerusalem, and the kingdoms of Israel really kind of centered around Samaria. Um, two tribes, in essence, the, king, the tribes of, of Judah and Benjamin, um, or portions of it, were down in the south, the rest of the tribes up in the north, with a division of the Levites uh, somewhere in, uh, between the two. Um, 130 years earlier, the kingdom of Israel had already fallen, along with their last king, Hosea, or Hosea, which also had done evil in the sight of the Lord. This was the beginning of how the ten tribes were lost. Uh, this is why you now we now call uh, Israelites Jews, which technically Jews are just of the tribe of Judah, Jews of Judah. Why do we call all Israelites just Jews? Because that's all that's left in essence. The ten tribes have been scattered and pretty much lost to history, which makes it incredible that prophecy says that they will return, uh, that they will they will be able to prove their heritage. Um, it's start reading into that prophecy, and it's just incredible how the Lord is going to restore that. When right now we look around and we can't find any, right? And they're calling for uh, the return of the tribes to to the kingdom of Israel. Um, the tribes of Judah, portions of Benjamin, and the Levites, and a small mixing of a few other members were the ones that remained for the next 130 years in, in, in Israel and uh, in the southern kingdom. And so with this devastation of Jerusalem and King Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, in essence, raising the city, and especially the temple, he takes the remnant to Babylon. And... Um, and so begins the exile of the Jews. And verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 36 says, The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. An interesting turn of phrase, an interesting wording. The, and the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. Why does the Lord decide to point this out? Because the kingdom of Israel, because the Jews had begun to leave behind the spiritual practices that the Lord had set forth, not following the Sabbath, not following the Sabbath rest, not following uh, leaving the land follow for a year on the seventh year, not following the year of Jubilee, and not just completely ignoring those spiritual commands and practices that the Lord had given them. And so 70 years was the owed time that the Lord determined that the land needed because of Israel's greed and disregard for the Lord's commands about the land and his blessings and his laws. Seventy years was, in essence, the sentence um, for following pagan ways and idolatry. And so from 586 B.C. to 516, 516 would be the completion of the temple, that's your 70 years. Um, and there's a few ways of different ways of counting it, but that's the one that most people, most historians agree on. 586 to 516, the completion of the temple. Fall of Jerusalem at 586, 70 years later, the completion of the temple. So it's with this historical backdrop that we, we understand what the Jews were facing when they were allowed to finally return to, to Israel. And, and, and to understand that they didn't know what they were about to do. They didn't know what, or excuse me, they didn't know what they were about to face. Um, a devastated land um, inhabited by thieves and bandits. Um, was, was, were portions of their family still left there? Had they fled to Egypt as some did? Um, did they survive the 50, 70 years? You know, what would they find? Were their homes still standing or were they taken over by the enemy or were they also burned down and crushed? Was the land, uh, had it been burned and, and, and left unarable or was it functional? Like, could they use it? They, they had no idea what they'd be facing. So in the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at what does it mean to, and, and what did the Jews, what were the Jews facing as they returned to the kingdom of Israel? And as they sought to restore 
not just the temple, but restore their fellowship with the Lord. Restore their, their spiritual, well, and, and really moral practices that the Lord had, had, had commanded them to follow um, throughout their whole history. And so what does it look like for, for the kingdom of Israel to be restored in this way? What does it look like for us as we look at facing difficult circumstances, facing the unknown, facing um, uh, opposition, and, and facing difficulties with timing. Because uh, sometimes we, we want things to happen in our timing and, and not putting it before the Lord. So as we look at uh, the spiritual restoration of Israel and we study through um, Ezra and, and Nehemiah and, and Esther, uh, these are the, the themes that we're going to focus on. Let me lead us in prayer and, and then we'll, we'll get into this uh, study. Father, I pray as we look at... Uh, this, this story, this historical account in the book of Ezra that we would, Lord, be challenged and encouraged. Lord, what a, um, it's difficult to, to put ourselves in this situation. This was so long ago, and yet the sentiment, the, uh, many of the emotions and the, the struggles that, that, that the Israelites were going through as they returned home are things that can resonate with us, Lord, the, the, the difficulties um, of being able to, to, in faith, put their future in your hands. Uh, and Lord, sometimes we face those same difficulties. Uh, Lord, we, we don't want to give up control. We, we want to know the plan. We want to know what's next. Uh, and sometimes that's not how you have for things to go about for us, Lord. Help us to learn to, in faith, put our trust in you, Lord, for, uh, for the future, for for the journey, for the, the, the decision, for the timing, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, we know that you are faithful, that you fulfill your promises. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me read, in, uh, starting in, in Ezra, and read uh, the first three verses here. It says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm, and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem and Judah, and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. Now, listen, we... we it's not that Cyrus has all of a sudden become a, you know, a, a believer, a Christian, a, a follower of the God of Israel. Uh, actually, this is one year after he conquers Babylon, and it was a common practice of this king to restore the places of worship um, throughout the lands that he conquered. Um, and actually becomes a practice of s several subsequent kings. Um, he very pointedly points out that it's the God of Israel in Jerusalem, like the God of that region, not the God of all. Um, it's the heart of the king is in the Lord's hands, even when there are pagan kings. And God's sovereignty is seen throughout all of these passages. Um, as we look through Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther, that, one of the, that, that theme is going to resonate throughout Scripture, God's sovereignty. Um, so we begin to understand a little bit more of, of, of what's going on with Israel. Not only is the land that, that they're about to go into returned into kind of its a wild, savage state, uh, but many of the towns and the cities that these people have left and fled, fled from or been uh, taken from were left devastated. Uh, we know that there were thieves and bandits roaming in the land from historical accounts. Uh, we know from scriptural accounts that there were spies that were reporting to um, to the the, the, um, the kingdoms in, in Babylon and and, uh, and uh, Persia. Um, there were also historical struggles with even Egypt uh, being kind of constantly. Uh, coming into the land and, and causing trouble as well. Um, there were jealous leaders and governors in the area that would 
end up opposing Israel in many of its projects and as they try to do the Lord's will. And so the question begins as, as, as the people of Israel think, okay, let's, let's go, let us return to, to our home. What would they be facing, right? What if, how are we going to do this? Um, what, they might have wondered, what did we sign up for? Uh, and you'll see some of these sentiments in, in the scripture. Um, I think it even perhaps the, 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 the question of, is this even safe, right? Is it safe for us to travel? But let me remind you, and, and let me set also kind of historically where this is in, in the Bible. Um, remember that the books of Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah are really the end of the historical books. Okay? So we, you know, you take Genesis, all you know, the, the Pentateuch, and then the books of history. You have, you know, first, second Samuel, first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles, Ezra, Esther, or Ezra, um, excuse me. Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. I, I tend to say Esther in between because Esther really is kind of in between. It actually takes place somewhere in the halfway through the first book of uh, through uh, Ezra, um, and then it ends with Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah are really um, contemporaries of the minor prophets. So really, when you add the books of history with Nehemiah, it's kind of the same time period as Malachi, right? As the end of the Old Testament. It's those same years, right? So when you end at Nehemiah, you're kind of then heading into those 400 years of silence um, until the birth of the Messiah. Uh, so that's kind of where it's set historically, right? As you read the minor prophets and even some of the major prophets, this is the same time period. They're somewhat contemporaries of each other. Um, so... The people of Israel that are returning to the land of Israel had many of the books of the Old Testament already written that they could refer back to. So let me, I'm going to refer to the Psalms, and we know that they had many of these Psalms written down as well. Look at Psalm 121. Hold your finger there in Ezra, but look at Psalm 121. says this I lift my up my eyes to the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth he will not let your foot slip he who watches over you will not slumber indeed he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep the Lord watches over you the Lord is your shade at your right hand the sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night the Lord will keep you from all harm he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. So as the, as the Jews prepared for this return to Israel, they had to depend on the Lord and for his provision, for his protection through this journey. Um, wherever you are in life, the Lord is with you. He's watching over you. Whatever you're going through, whatever the journey, whatever the decision, he is trustworthy. He is faithful. His purpose is to lead us closer to himself. And so as we look at, at these, these portions in the book of Ezra, we can take cues from the people of Israel as they struggled with these decisions. As, and, and how they made these decisions is interesting too. We're going to look at a few examples of this. But how do we trust the Lord um, with, with these difficulties? Fifty years after their brutal exile in, into the land of, of, of Babylon, um, Cyrus writes the decree to, to, to free the people, to give them the, the ability to return. And they're facing this unknown situation, right? Facing the, the what were we, were we gonna, are we going to arrive at when we get home? Nearly two generations have passed. Now this is about 50 years. The 70 years are not complete. But at the 50 years is when Cyrus said, okay, you can return. And the first, there were three, there were three returns really. One, 
The first return of the exiles under Zerubbabel, which was a prince of Judah. Second return under Ezra, and a third return under Nehemiah. Um, this We're going to really focus in on the first one here. But nearly two generations have passed, 50 years. Think of how different time, how different culture, how different the people were in 50 years, not just 50 years in their land, 50 years in a foreign land, right? Um, we know for, for a fact that now most of the Jews spoke Aramaic instead of Hebrew, or at least as a first language and with Hebrew being taught, um, knowing it as a second language. There were people who were still alive who had come, who had been exiled prior, but they're at least 55 years old or thereabouts, if they have any memories, because it would be difficult for a two or three year old to remember in Israel. Uh, perhaps a five year old would, but you're talking there at the youngest 55 years old to have any memories of home and of, of, of culture and of, of what that looked like. Um, but not only that, then the question of what are they returning home to? Were their family and friends? Were their enemies? This is about a five, five and a half month long journey on foot from Babylon to Jerusalem. Um, let me read to you a few portions if you'd actually turn to Ezra chapter eight, uh, because it doesn't give us much insight in the first return, but chapter eight does. This, this is actually in reference to Ezra's return with a group of exiles, but it gives some insight into what it was like. Um, let me read in verse uh, uh, 15, starting verse 15 here for me. Ezra 8, 15, it says, I assembled them at the canal that flows toward Ahava, and we camped there three days. When I checked among the people and the priests, I found no Levites there, so I summoned Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elthana, Jerob, El El Nathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshulam, who were the leaders, um, and Joyarib and El Nathan, who were the men of learning. And he, he sends them out to, to gather uh, some of the, the, uh, the Levites to, to come with this, this group. But j jump down to verse 21. It says, There by the Ahava Canal I proclaimed a fast. This is before they really start the main portion of their journey. I proclaimed a fast so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us and our children with all of our possessions. I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had told them the king, or because we had told the king, the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks to him, but his greater anger is against all the, against all who forsake him. So we fastened, we fasted and petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayer. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests together with Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brothers. And I weighed out to them the offering of silver and gold and the articles that the king, his advisors, his officials, and all Israel present had donated from the house of our God. I'll stop there, but basically he's splitting up because they were traveling with tremendous amounts of wealth, which was incredible that not only had Cyrus returned the, the, the temple gifts and the, the articles of gold and silver and bronze, uh, the articles of the tab ancient articles of the tabernacle, but then tremendous amounts of wealth that he was returning to the land of Israel, really to gain favor for himself. He, he over and over he says, and pray for the king and his sons and for his longevity and prosperity. Right. So he had some selfish reasons there, but here they are with no official guards, burdened down with tremendous amounts of wealth on a journey of five, five and a half months through a land of thieves and bandits. Um, and so he portions out into 12 because if one gets attacked, then hopefully the others can escape and return some of it. Um, it's, it's implied there and it's, it's like, man, I mean, that's, that's scary, right? Uh, you don't really uh, catch on to that if you just read through it really quick. As we talk about Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah, we talk about the sovereignty and, and restoration. These are the themes that we'll see throughout this. Um, God is sovereign over all, all peoples, whether they are his people or not. He is creator. He is sustainer. Whether they are the enemy, whether they are a pagan king, whether they are bandits and thieves on the road, he is sovereign. 
He is sovereign over time. He is sovereign over timing. Um, he is sovereign through every situation. This is the God that we worship and know as our Savior and Father. He controls history and orchestrates history for his purposes. So who else would we depend on? Who else would we turn to for guidance, for wisdom, for protection? Who else would we turn to to, to submit our will to? He is sovereign. He is sovereign over all. He fulfills his promises and he is faithful. We will see this, this recurring theme also of restoration in these next few weeks. Uh, the restoration of the temple, the restoration of the city walls, the restoration of, of the, the feasts and the ceremonies and the practices that God had instituted for the kingdom of Israel. Uh, the restoration of people to their homes and to their lands. Um, and the restoration of the people's moral and spiritual walk uh, with the Lord, of their, of their life and of their heart. And I believe that these, these themes parallel some of our own journey and the feelings and the thoughts that we have as, as a church body and, and as individuals as we venture into the unknown. What's ahead of us for our church body, for this church? We don't really know. It's not like we can say, well, on this date or this person or what will happen in between. And, and I realize I'm, I'm speaking in a general sense of this congregation. I don't know the necessarily the specifics of what your journey is today or this next coming, coming week or next year. What health struggles you may have, what struggles of emotion you may have, what your family might be going through, your finances might be going through, a change in jobs that you might be going through. All of these things are in the Lord's hands. Over all of these things, he is sovereign over and through all of these things. He is faithful. But let's get back to the text here. Look at Ezra chapter 2. Um, and let me just read quickly in verse 1. It says, Now these are the people of the province who came from the, up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken captive to Babylon. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. And then chapter three goes through, 2 goes through a very long list of names and numbers, which I'm, we're not going to take the time to read. Um, but the towns and the conditions that these, that, that these places were in was of great worry and concern. Obviously, there was excitement to return home, but there's also that, that concern of, you know, how are we going to do this? What, what are we going to find when we get there? Um, trust the Lord, right? As, the, as we read in Psalm 121, that he knows our coming and our going. He has our, uh, the plans in hand. Um, he is trustworthy. He is faithful. And as he leads, whatever that journey is and however long it takes, it is only to draw us closer to himself, not to lead us away. We did that on our own. Let's turn to Ezra in chapter 3. And let me read a, a, a few portions in, in this as well. And this is where we start to see the opposition that Israel faced as they came home, as they arrived home. In Ezra chapter 3, starting in verse 3, it says, uh, let me read 3 and 4 here. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord both the morning and evening sacrifices. Then, in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed each day. Uh, jump down to uh, verse 11. And it says, With praise and thanksgiving they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love to Israel endures forever. And all the peoples gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. With many others, while many others shouted for joy, 
No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made such noise, and the sound was heard far away. Keep going, and we'll keep reading in, verse, in chapter 4. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build this house, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Je Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They hired counselors to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia, with, by the way, the reigns of Xerxes and Artaxerxes in between. How often the devil seeks to disrupt a good thing in our life, personally, individually, in our church, right? How often the devil seeks to disrupt. But remember, he, the devil is no slouch. He's not lazy. And he is not an amateur. He is the literal mastermind of trickery and deceit. The people that, that came to speak to uh, the Jews uh, during the, 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 as they laid the foundation of the temple were the people that came from the north, uh, from Samaria and those areas. Uh, and these are other, also other peoples that had been actually imported by the Assyrian kings from other kingdoms that they had conquered and brought them to the lands around, the, the, around Samaria. And for 130 years now, actually 180 years, these people have been intermarrying, worshiping all other gods, uh, several references to Marduk from Babylon to still Assyrian uh, gods and goddesses. It, it was just a mishmash of religions, pagan worship, idol worship. And yes, they still, at least they claim to, oh, we also, in addition to all the other things we do, worship your God, the God of Israel. Let us help you. No. Um, these folks were had no part, or should have no part, in the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, and they're... they're these tactics that they used then to oppose Israel uh, as they were told no are pretty familiar. Uh, I think they're pretty identifiable and common to us even today. Uh, the world stage today, it will not tolerate, you know, something like uh, violence. Or, or perhaps a hate crime against the church, right? If we, we hear about church shootings and the whole world is in an uproar, or at least most, right? Um, that's not tolerated, right? When you talk about the enemies of Israel coming and like attacking, right? They, they, they used much more subtle methods. But certainly today you hear about entire, you know, a church and even entire congregations getting canceled and shut down because they spoke against homosexuality because they spoke against sin, because they spoke against addiction, because they spoke against, you know, um, well, many other issues. And opposition today really comes more along the lines of underhanded malevolence. Subtle, passive-aggressive, sometimes more aggressive than passive, but that underhanded malevolence. And in essence, you either accept our worldly ways, kind of the message that these people are giving, accept our worldly ways, whatever they may be, or whatever you might label it as, or we're going to label you a hater uh, and cancel you, and we're going to label you a bigot and, you know, completely ruin your name and make you a pariah in society. And that's, that's what they're doing to Israel. 
In fact, they, they, the, the, they even write a letter to the king, a very simpering um, letter to the king to say, look what these Jews are doing. They're you know, doing something they shouldn't, and they're going to rebuild a rebellion against you, and you're going to lose profits. And that just seems a very familiar tactic. It seems almost more something that somebody would do even today. They've been doing it all along, folks. Like I said, Satan is the literal mastermind of trickery and deceit. And he's been working for a long, long time. He is no amateur. When the Jews rightfully reject their offer, uh, they begin this campaign of malignant and deceitful opposition against them, culminating, like I said, in this letter, this uh, simpering, tell, tattletale style letter written to, to the king. Sadly, the king then believes them, um, doesn't really investigate, and they write that they, they, they had begun their opposition um, during the time of, of Xerxes. So this would be the second king. The king that followed after uh, Cyrus. And then they write a letter to Artaxerxes. And he puts a stop to it. Xerxes was the king of Ahasuerus. Okay, we're going to look at him when we talk about Esther. Uh, he was apparently not, the letter was not written during his time, but they had opposed the Jews during this time. Uh, but King Artaxerxes believes him. And for nearly 20 years, about 18 years, for nearly 20 years, the work on the temple is halted. The, the, the foundations were laid, but it was halted. Don't expect fairness and justice from this world, folks. Um, we don't expect to don't expect to be paid what you're worth. Uh, don't expect to be understood. Don't expect to be treated with fairness and honesty. We don't live in the kingdom any, yet. The, the, the Lord is, is sovereign over all, but this is a fallen world, and we see its effects daily. And we'll see its effects perhaps even more as time goes on. But look at Psalm 118, if you would. Let me read a few verses here. It says, Psalm 118 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. In my anguish I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They swarmed around me like bees, but they died out as quickly as burning thorns. And in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Stop there. Take comfort in knowing again that He is sovereign. That He is in control. That even when our plans don't work out, when we are falsely accused, when we are misunderstood, when we are ostracized, He is still God. And He is still our God. And we are still His sons. And He is in control. He is creator and sustainer. He is the beginning and the end. Who better to put our trust and our faith in? Third point, trusting the Lord through difficult circumstances. Trusting the Lord with timing. And I'll end quickly because I'm pushing it. For 18 years, the foundations of the temple uh, of the Lord sat unfinished. 18 years is a long time. That's an 
you know, a baby to near adulthood. For those foundations to just sit there in that way. Constantly they were enduring the opposition of those around them, the jealousy of greedy neighbors, spies, false reports. They basically put a whole campaign of malevolence against them, against them to like even mess up, the implication is to mess up their paperwork, to mess up their trade agreements, to mess up the, 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 the wood and the cedar and the stone that was supposed to come from the north. And I mean, just constantly opposing them in every way that they could. By all accounts, it was very frustrating. It was a very frustrating, maddening mess that they had to face. It's no wonder that any of us wouldn't begin to cry out, How long, O oh Lord? Right? How long is this going to go on? Have you ever wondered why is it taking so long? Why can't it be now, Lord? This is a good thing, right? So, so why not now? I mean, why am I waiting a year, two years, five years, 18 years? Or the opposite, right? You know, why now? You know, if you consider something terrible happening, why now? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to us? What promises can we turn to to know that God's plan, to know what God's plan is for us? Turn to, keep, keep a bookmark there in your finger there in Jer and, uh, Ezra, but turn to Jeremiah 29. You might have guessed, but verse 11. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Some of you may have already been thinking, oh yes, I, this, that's the verse he's going to read, right? That's the verse you, you turn to. How do I know that I can depend on the Lord? Because he has plans to prosper, right? Right? It's a common verse that we, we quote and memorize and refer to. But do you remember the context? Remember that it was Jeremiah who prophesied the 70 years in the first place. He was the one who told them, yeah, you're going to pay for it. Um, so he, he's the one who prophesied the 70 year exile of the Jews. There's a lot more to this verse if we take it in context. So let's read it in the context it's intended to be and see the Lord's loving and beautiful and faithful, hopeful promises to his people. Let, let me go back and read verse 1 for a second. It says, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah, hear this, sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This verse that we constantly memorize and refer back to about the Lord having plans to prosper, in the context, it's to these people we're studying. Jump down to verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for, for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then I will call. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. So back to our story. And in Ezra chapter, turn to Ezra chapter 6. And in verse 3 it says, In the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. Let the temple be rebuilt as a place to present sacrifices and let its foundations be laid. It is to be 90 feet high and 90 feet wide and with three courses of large stone and one of timber. 
and the costs are to be paid from the royal treasury. Uh, jump down to verse 6. Now then, Tatnai, so these are the governors who uh, went against them, right? Now then, Tatnai, governor of the trans Euphrates, and Shethar, Bozani, and you, their fellow officials of that province, stay away from there. Do not interfere with the work on this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I hereby decree what you are to do for these elders of the Jews in the construction of the house of God. The expense of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury from the revenues of the trans Euphrates, so that the work will not stop. I'll stop there. But he goes on to say, like, you will provide for all of their needs. And if you don't, I'll pull a beam out of your house and impale you on it. Which is pretty um, encouraging uh, to do what the king says, right? Uh, couldn't have been a little, been, been any clearer. Whether it takes two weeks or 20 years, the Lord is not forgetful or lazy. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Not once, not ever. Turn your fears and your worries over to the Lord. Your, even your impatience, turn it over to the Lord. Exercise and work out your faith by putting the timing of it all into his hands. He is faithful. Let me end by just reading from again from the book of Psalms. In Psalm 40. Again, a psalm that the exiles had access to. How can we trust the Lord during difficult circumstances? How can we trust the Lord? when we don't know what's ahead with the unknown. Trusting the Lord during opposition. Trusting the Lord when the timing just seems off or not according to what we would want. Over and over again we see that he is faithful. That he provides for his people. In Psalm 40, I'll read a few verses here. Really addresses this so clearly. It says in Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods, Many, O oh Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you have planned for us. No one can recount to you. Were I, were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. God is faithful to his people. He does not lead us in wandering paths away from himself. He leads us closer to him. Does he allow us to go through times of difficulty? Yes. Does he allow opposition to come and, 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 and poke at his people, at us? Does he allow the enemy to gain ground and, and to oppose? Yes. He challenges us. He challenges our faithfulness so that we might stand before him, that we might subject our will before him, that we might subject our, our timing and, 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 and our patience and our desires before him. But if we were to start to describe all the things that the Lord has done for us, it would be too many to declare. Trust the Lord. He is sovereign. And he is faithful. Whatever is, is to come for us individually in our you know, lives and what's going on with us personally, and we trust the Lord as a congregation, as a church. He is building his church. He is sovereign. And it is his people and his church to build. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this study that we are getting into. Lord, I pray that it would be a benefit to, to everyone, Lord. And, uh, 
Uh, as we look at how you minister to how you minister to the people of Israel during this difficult time, how you brought them through um, persecution and 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 the unknown, Lord, and how even you challenged the expectation of their timing, Lord, you were ever faithful to them. Uh, Lord, help us to learn from their example and, and from the examples of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther as we look in the next couple of weeks at, at, uh, at their life and their story as well. Father, help us as we face challenges throughout each week. And Lord, as we look to you for the future even of our own church, Lord, we know that you are faithful and that you are sovereign and you are all-deserving of praise. In Jesus' name.